Welcome, good morning, and many thanks for attending our virtual conference entitled Race and the Death Penalty. This conference is sponsored by Amnesty International USA Dallas and co-sponsored by the Racial Justice Coalition, SMU Human Rights Program, Texas Moratorium Network, Read Justice Initiative, Dallas-Fort Worth Chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, the League of Women Voters Dallas, the League of Women Voters Texas, Texas Death Penalty, Abolition Movement, Pax Christi Dallas, Peace Mennonite Church, Dallas Quaker Friends Meeting, Peter Johnson in Institute for Nonviolence, Good Street Baptist Church, Paradise Missionary Baptist Church, Houston Peace and Justice Center, The Prison Show at KPFT 90.1 FM, Lead Better Neighborhood Association, Austin Abolitionists and Shape Community Center in Houston. The purpose of this conference is to highlight the inherent systemic injustices within the application of the death penalty and how race is a key factor in determining executions. The impact that race has on our system of justice is well documented. The foundation and historical roots of American policing were created to catch runaway slaves, to keep white people safe from black people, and to protect colonial slave labor investments in order to maintain economic order. This set the tone and established the order in which the law is, is adjudicated. Whether it be the unfair trial of the Scottsboro boys or the complicity of local law enforcement in the decimation of the predominantly black Greenwood area during the infamous Tulsa race riots, this gives us a window into understanding why black lives have not mattered and how capricious the US criminal justice system is with regards to race and the death penalty. Since executions were resumed in the US on January 17, 1977, the country has put to death 1,532 individuals with 2,600 more currently waiting to be killed. The US government conducted three executions within a four day span earlier this month between January 13th and 16th, including Lisa Montgomery, the first woman executed since 1953, an intellectually disabled African-American man, Corey Johnson, and another African-American man, Dustin Higgs, executed on Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. The US government executed 13 people last year, making it the leading execution jurisdiction in the United States for the first time in American history. The next scheduled execution in the USA is set for February 10th, when Texas is due to execute Edward Busby Jr. President Biden has vowed to abolish the federal death penalty within the first 100 days of his presidency. Given that, we're encouraging state representatives and district attorneys to seriously consider our concerns and suggestions. We want district attorneys to refrain from seeking the death penalty, and we want our representatives to sponsor legislation towards abolishing the death penalty. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist. Uh, he is none other than Dr. Rick Halperin, uh, who began teaching human rights courses in 1990 in the William P. Clements Department of History at SMU. After being chosen as director of the new Embry Human Rights Program, he began overseeing its, its academic program, planning its public events, and developing a wide array of human rights focused trips. Halperin has held many leadership positions in human rights and social justice organizations. During his more than 40 year affiliation with Amnesty International USA, he has served as chair of its board of directors three times. He's also served on the boards of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, the Center for Survivors of Torture, the International Rescue Committee, and the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. He has participated in a UN human rights delegation that inspected Irish prison conditions in Dublin and Belfast, 
as well as in delegations monitoring human rights in El Salvador and Palestinian refugee camps in Gaza. Hepburn holds degrees in Southern U.S. history from Auburn University, uh, Southern U.S. history from Southern Methodist University, and the U.S. history from George Washington University where he achieved his B.A. in 1971. He's also studied at the Sorbonne in Paris from 1968 to 69. So without further ado, we'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Rick Halpern. Uh, well, thanks Mustafa and thank you all for uh, attending. Glad you could join us on this Saturday. Um, I just a quick note, I'm gonna be giving a really broad overview uh, about the links in American history between uh, slavery, uh, racism, race riots, lynching, and how we came to the notorious McCleskey decision in 1987. So it's a lot to cover uh, in a short period of time. Uh, let me just start by offering a few sources that are relevant to this material for folks. Um, I thought these might be uh, inf uh, helpful for you. So one, I think uh, you should definitely be aware, if you're not already, of the Death Penalty Information Center and its website. Uh, they have great statistics there on many aspects of the death penalty, whether it's financial cost, uh, innocence, and certainly related to race and death sentencing. And I'm sorry, it's the educator in me, so I just want to mention a few books relevant uh, to this topic, and I'll be very quick. Um, one of them, A People's History of the United States uh, by Howard Zinn. It's excellent. Uh, a very provocative book and also very, uh, very well received. Stamped from the beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. This is a disturbing read and it's uh, spot on and I'll be referring to this throughout my talk. Uh, wherever you are, you certainly don't have to be in Texas, uh, there's a very thick book you can see, but it's called States Laws on Race and Color. And this book is a compendium of these kinds of racist laws state by state in this country. Um, it's very, very eye-opening to say the least. I would say a, uh, a powerful book on lynching, uh, is, it's called Without Sanctuary, uh, Lynching Photography in America. And uh, I just forewarn you, it's a, a history of photography, photographs of lynching, it's disturbing and it's, uh, it's not easy to look at, but it's in part how we confront our past. And the last but not least, and specific to the notorious Warren McCleskey case, which I'm going to be mentioning at the end of my talk today, is this book. It's called Imprisoned by the Past, Warren McCleskey, Race, and the American Death Penalty. Uh, and I would urge people on this particular topic to be very aware of this book because this case was in its time significant and its impact today for all of us is still profound. Okay, with all of that being said, let me jump into this in a hurry. Uh, you know, we're in 2021, and you and I uh, could argue that the most significant word in our society today is the E word, equality. Everything in our country today is supposed to be based on equality. We know it isn't, but it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to be discriminated against because of your race, your language, your sexual orientation, your gender, your ability or disability from a wheelchair to physical health. Nothing is supposed to discriminate against you. And, and this is the way it should be. But this is pretty atypical of our country's history. The, our country, and I'm talking about from colonial settlement in 1607 to today, it's only 414 years old. It's not a long history. The overwhelming history in our country 
is the history of discrimination. If you ask, how do you, what is this discrimination? In broad terms, it's this. From colonial inception, and you could argue even into today, the history of America when it comes to social justice and human rights issues has been the history of elite, privileged, Protestant, white, male, wealthy businessmen against everybody else, uh, including other white males who are not in that group of elite, privileged businessmen. Uh, the, the founding fathers, their vision of America had nothing, nothing to do with the country that you and I live in today. You and I can associate a lot of great ideal, idealistic words, freedom, uh, religious liberty, opportunity, perhaps justice. Uh, but the word equality had nothing to do with the founding fathers. Their vision of America was the following. America was to be run by them, white males of privilege. They were to be citizens, which meant that as citizens, they could vote, they could make the laws, they could run for office, they could serve on juries, and they could carry weapons. Nobody else was to have this privilege. So the founding fathers, had, they had nothing to do with women, nothing to do with Jews, nothing to do with Catholics, nothing to do with Native Americans, and certainly nothing to do with people of color, even free people of color. There was no E word, there was no equality. This was a hierarchy of discrimination with white men at the top, and that is how this country was founded. All right, so slaves came to America starting in 1619. This terrible institution lasted until 1865, 246 years of legalized brutality, oppression in which an entire group of people, of course, were not even seen as people, they were seen as property that you could buy, sell, beat, sexually assault, or kill with impunity. It just happened to be property that could reproduce and make money for you, but they were not human beings. The notorious Dred Scott Supreme Court decision of 1857, still considered to be one of the worst decisions in our nation's history. Nine white males, seven Democrats, two Republicans, decided in 1857 that slavery was legal throughout the entire United States from Key West to the Northwest, and that as long as there was to be a United States, according to the Supreme Court decision of Dred Scott, people of color, including free people of color, were never, ever, ever, ever going to be considered citizens. They were never going to be seen as people with rights that the white man was bound to respect. And that's the language from the case, not my language. Uh, they were to be subservient people, uh, but certainly nothing to do with equality. But then the war came in 1861. Uh, the war upset all of the plans for Dred Scott. And in the war, the Civil War, the war between the states, as it was known here in the South, some 800,000 Americans were killed, including 350,000 white Southerners. During the war, every single Southern state had many different secret white male-based terroristic groups to keep slaves and free people of color peaceful so there would be no slave uprisings during the war. And many of these organizations existed deep into the 20th century. So they had names such as the White Line, the White Brotherhood, the Men of Justice, the Council of Safety, and perhaps the two most violent and most notorious would be the Knights of the White Camellia in Louisiana and the Knights of the Rising Sun here in Texas. Uh, these were pure terror organizations that conducted raids and killing of people of color with total impunity during the war. After the war, which the South lost and left the South in ruins, all of those groups were superseded in 1865 by the formation of the Ku Klux Klan 
which obviously still exist today. The Klan was not a Southern phenomenon. It became tragically a national phenomenon and even established uh, branches in Canada and in various countries in Europe. Uh, the Klan considered itself to be an organization of chivalry and patriotism, but as we all know, it was based on racial terror. And so we entered the second phase of reconstruction where punishing people of color took on two different forms and they existed simultaneously, lynching and race riots. These were both forms of racial terror conducted by whites, uh, white mobs against an individual or groups of individuals or sometimes entire communities of individuals of color. Uh, lynching was primarily in the South, but it was nationwide. You had, uh, you had Asians lynched on the West Coast, uh, Native Americans lynched in the Dakotas, African Americans lynched as far north as Duluth, Minnesota. It wasn't just a Southern problem, but primarily a Southern problem. And this terrible legacy of our past lasted about a half a century. Uh, from the 1880s when statistics about lynching first began to be kept until it, it died out primarily uh, in the early uh, mid 1930s. So we had approximately 4,700 people that we know of that were lynched in this country. No one knows the real numbers. No one will ever know the real numbers. But for known numbers, it's about 4,700 people. And as I say, this was also at the same time of race riots, which were mostly urban and rural phenomenons at the same time. So we had race riots from 1866 into the 1940s in urban areas such as Houston, New Orleans, Memphis, Atlanta, the nation's capital. And you had them in smaller places like Longview, Texas, in East Texas. Uh, you had them in a place called Elaine, Arkansas, East St. Louis. These were racial attempts by white mobs to punish, kill, and economically cripple, if not destroy, uh, black communities, and especially black communities of wealth. This went on. In 1896, the second major and notorious Supreme Court decision would be the Plessy versus Ferguson, which of course legalized uh, separate but equal. So it wasn't legal to kill slaves anymore. That ended in 1865. But for another 89 more years, we had legal segregation. So just combining slavery and segregation before I turn to the death penalty, slavery and segregation in the name of the law by the federal government comprise 83% of America's history. It's not hard to see why in 2021, there's so much racism and anger encompassed by the law because this is the norm. The law has always been used in American history to punish and especially discriminate against non-white people. This is the norm, it's not the aberration. Okay, we come down now to uh, the eve of World War uh, I. Lynching finally became a federal crime in 1936, uh, largely through the efforts of Ida B. Wall. She did not live to see it. She campaigned her whole life to make it a crime. She died and finally in the second term of FDR, lynching finally became a federal crime. And as lynchings declined, and I must add here quickly, the worst decade in American history of lynching occurred in the 1890s, when throughout the entire decade, each year of the 1890s, an average of 111 people were lynched in this country. That's two people a week, for heaven's sake. By the 1930s, we were down to 28 people a year, which is still a person every other week, but 28 people too many. Okay. Bear in mind that as lynchings began to decline, the incarceration rates of poor people and African-American people in particular began to rise. And again, I remind you 
that what you and I may take for granted as having the right to a lawyer, that did not become law in the United States until 1963. So you can imagine how many people in American history who were poor, whether they were white or people of color, and especially people of color who were charged with crimes, had no lawyers, no representation, too bad for them, they went to jail or were executed with no legal help whatsoever. Okay, let's fast forward to the last very quick part of this, which is the death penalty as a part of punishing people in American history. We've executed over 19,000 people in American history. This is a norm, again, a tragic norm. The death penalty, uh, as we knew it, was stopped temporarily by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1972, and it was allowed to restart uh, in the Greg v. Georgia decision in 1976. And death execution started in 1977, as Mustafa uh, mentioned in his uh, intro, and in the early 1980s, executions mostly across the Deep South, uh, the death belt uh, with these links to slavery and lynching just extended it to executing people. And heavily, most of these people that were executed in the 80s, uh, not surprisingly, were African-American men accused of terrible crimes uh, and crimes against white people. The case of Warren McCleskey he was an African-American man in Atlanta convicted of murdering a white police officer. And his lawyers, what makes this case so uh, special and so terrible is this. McCleskey's lawyers argued that lots of people were convicted of murdering police officers in Atlanta. Many of them were white people but didn't get a death sentence. And they were arguing that death sentencing for blacks who killed police officers in Atlanta was discriminatory. The case was seen as the best case to stop the death penalty in the United States if the US Supreme Court agreed that the death penalty was racist. The decision came down in 1987 by the narrowest of margins, five to four, and the US Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty is racist, that there is racism in the American criminal justice system, but Lewis Powell that made the deciding vote against Warren McCleskey. McCleskey was executed. The court ruled that defendant, there may be racism in the in criminal justice system, but McCleskey and every other defendant had to show that the prosecutors were racist against the individual defendant, regardless of all the statistics that said that this is a racist system. And it's an impossible bar for any defendant to meet. McCleskey was executed, and since 1987, no major U.S. Supreme Court case has ever challenged stopping the death penalty on the institution of race. And I'll conclude with this. The McCleskey decision, the justice that gave it, Lewis Powell, who served 33 years on the court, he said it was the worst decision he ever made. He wished he could take it back too little too late. This decision is known as the Dred Scott decision of the death penalty movement. And we have never approached anything like it since. Is the death penalty racist? Of course it is because the American criminal justice system has been racist since its inception. Thank you so much. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you, Rick, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, our next speaker is none other than Mr. Roger Reed. He is the brother of Rodney Reed, and he's here to, to tell us about the Rodney Reed case and how it impacts race. Uh, the Reed Justice Initiative aims to equip and empower families that are in the process of overcoming severe transgressions imposed by the criminal justice system by encouraging the act of challenging justice, injustice. We believe in justice for all. We are focusing our efforts on death row families and their loved ones, death row exonerees, non-death row exonerees, and family members of the executed. We advocate for a Texas statewide prosecutorial con uh, conduct commission 
We advocate for law enforcement oversight commissions for every town, city, and county in Texas. We advocate for transformative justice, taking elements from restorative practices to actualize a more just, equitable, and healthier justice system and society. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Roderick Reed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Um, well, <clears throat> I'm here to tell you, um, Dr. Rick, you know, he, 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 he did a good job, you know, with all the facts and statistics and everything. And, and he's, he's on point on everything that he said. And, and, uh, but <clears throat> I'm living, I'm living it. You know, my family is living it. My brother's living it. Uh, racism plays a big part in this case. Um, from the very beginning, as you got to understand, <clears throat> ever since Bastrop was erected in 1832, it's been predominantly white on ran. This is a small southern Texas town. And um, they're very, very racist around here in these parts. I I'm just trying to keep it, keep it neat. But um, my brother was convicted of the rape and murder of Stacy Stites, a 19-year-old white female, who was all she, Stacy, was engaged with a white cop by the name of Jenny, Jimmy Fennell. He was a Giddings police officer. They were engaged. At the same time, Stacy Stites was seeing my brother, and they say other people, but I know she was seeing my brother. Well. Jimmy found out, in our opinion, all the facts, forensics, everything points, he killed her. But they won't admit that. I'm gonna get to that in a minute. He found out <clears throat> he killed her. And later on, they set my brother up for the murder. There was DNA evidence in the truck, which they released within a week back to Jimmy Fennell. There was DNA to crime scene that was not tested. There was all kinds of misprosecutorial conduct in this. They broke all kinds of laws, putting my brother on death row. And he had an all white jury, elderly jury. He didn't have a jury of his peers and everything all the evidence points to other people besides Rodney Reed. We've been trying to admit evidence since the beginning. There's testimonies that has not been admitted. There's DNA that has not been tested. There's witnesses that have not been called. And yet, you got a man on death row. You're trying to take his life. And that is something that, first off, is just wrong to take a life anyway, because we do not believe in the death penalty. But secondly, to deny a person a fair chance, as Dr. Rick Helpman was saying, equality. We did not have that. Justice was not there. Justice was in the streets when it came to my brother's case. You know, um, and for years, my brother's been there on death row now for 23 years, locked up 23 hours a day for a crime he did not commit. There's medical reports from Dr. Baden, who did the uh, autopsy on JFK, Martin Luther King, Dr. Riddick, Dr. Spence, they all did independent studies and they all come to the same conclusion. Stacy Stice was dead long before 12 midnight, which places 
her at home by Jimmy Fennell's own testimony, they were together at that time. Not only did they do a testing on the evidence, Dr. Phil had his own medical examiner tested. He came over his own independent studies. So, but we've been trying to admit this for the longest now. We've been trying to get this in and they will not allow this, okay? And then there's DNA evidence. Where have you ever heard in a murder case that all DNA evidence is not tested? That's, I believe, COP 101, you know, test everything, but they have not tested it. So we've been fighting, like I say, for 23 years, an uphill battle, you know, and um, when it all started, the day they convicted my brother, my mother told them that God has his hands in this and you will not take my son's life without the whole world knowing about it. And that's when we stood together as a family and started fighting and we're still fighting. This nightmare still is alive. It's, it's still going. My brother's still in death row, you know? And so racist, yes. You know, there was a time right after my brother was convicted that I couldn't go down the street without getting pulled over every other block. I was blackballed and bastrop from even getting a job. I could, I got two degrees. I couldn't get a job in McDonald's. Racist, yes. It plays a big part in the justice system. It is corruption, you know, and you talk about corruption. The sheriff at that time that ran on the thing that if you elect me, I will give you the murder of Stacy Stites. He was later convicted of, I believe, seven felonies. Jimmy Fennell, Stacy Stites' boyfriend, was convicted of rape and abduction while on duty as a police officer. David Boyd, the Chief of Police, City Police in Bastrop at that time was convicted of DWI and other things. Corruption runs all rampant through here, along with racism. And we're still fighting to this day. And I'd like to thank everybody that has supported Rodney, that has been there for the family, their prayers and everything, because it means the world to us. And we've we've come a long way. God has been good. He's 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 Wow, you know, we've had over five million signatures, amicus letter written by active and retired police. We've had stars, Kim Kardashian, Dr. Phil. We had bipartisan support, Democrats and Republicans saying Rodney Reed deserve a new trial. But yet, Rodney Reed is still on death row. So where it stands right now, before I close, um, we're waiting on an evidentiary hearing. May 17th here in Bastrop. And that is to try to admit all the evidence that I previously spoke about <clears throat> and, and then some. Uh, May 17th, and we heard the uh, quarter, Texas Court of Criminal Appeals has issued a order to the ju judge in this case to uh, have a disposition in this in my brother's case come to a head within 180 days so that's where we stand at right now and for everybody that's wondering about my brother he is doing well his spirits are up he's very hopeful and um he sends his love to everybody that believes in him thank you
Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, all right. Yeah, well, anyway, I was I was saying we're praying for you and the family. Uh, give your brother our love and that we're going to stay in the fight with you as much as we can. So thank you so much for coming and sharing uh, this information uh, for all of us. Okay. All right, our next speaker is Sister Helen Prejean. Uh, she's given our keynote on race and the death penalty. Sister Helen is known around the world for her tireless work against the death penalty. She has been instrumental in sparking national dialogue on capital punishment and in the shaping the Catholic Church's vigorous opposition to all executions. Born on April 21st, 1939 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, she joined the Sisters of St. Joseph in 1957. She worked as a high school teacher and served as the religious edu director, education director at St. Francis Cabrini Parish in New Orleans before moving into the St. Thomas Housing Project in the early 80s. In 1982, Sister Helen began corresponding with Patrick Sunier who had been sentenced to death for the murder of two teenagers. Two years later, when Patrick Sunier was put to death in the electric chair, Sister Helen was there to witness his execution. In the following months, she became spiritual advisor to another death row inmate, Robert Lee Willie, who was to meet the same fate as Sunier. After witnessing these ex executions, Sister Helen realized that this lethal ritual would remain unchallenged unless its secrecy was stripped away. And so she sat down and wrote a book, Dead Man Walking, an eyewitness account of the death penalty in the United States. The book ignited a national debate on capital punishment and spawned an Academy Award winning movie, a play and an opera. Sister Helen's second book, The Death of Innocence, an eyewitness account of wrongful executions was published in 2004. And her third book, River of Fire, My Spiritual Journey in August of 2019. So without fur further ado, we'd like to welcome Sister Helen Prejean uh, to, uh, to give us our keynote address on race and the death penalty. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, everybody. Boy, am I glad to be here. Rick, great, great overview. Rick and I got started almost about, at the, although I was present at the execution of Pat Sonia in 84, but 90, you began, um, Rick, anywhere before then. And Rick has always been somebody to get us the information. You can't move and you can't act and you can't stress unless you understand the race that's been in it from the beginning, to have that grasp of history. And I'm glad you recommend books to us. We need to be reading books. We need to dig deep. And, uh, and then of course, you, Roderick, to be with you and with your brother. You know what I just figured out? Uh, thanks to my African-American brothers and sisters, when I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects in New Orleans, here a white, privileged, naive woman, a nun who thought at first that if I just prayed hard enough, all of God was going to take care of all the problems of the world. And River of Fire is all about waking up. And waking up is just a huge thing in our lives. Waking up and then joining hands in community to, to work with what we have come become aware of. So through my African-American brothers and sisters who became my teachers, when I moved in St. Thomas. And I learned for the first time about white privilege. I learned about my own privilege. And then just seeing, seeing nothing. There's a saying in Latin America, what the eye does not see, the heart cannot feel. And that's why I wrote Dead Man Walking. It's to bring people inside the execution chamber, bring people in touch with their outrage at a crime, the suffering of victims' families, but then come to a place, is this what we do as a nation? And so from the beginning, 
first thing I learned from Millard Farmer, the lawyer, the good lawyer from Atlanta who took the appeals of, of and, and Pat Sonier and tried to save his life, how racist the application of the death penalty is. Because it's up to the discretion of prosecutors to seek death or not. What these federal executions have just showed us is that when you give individuals the power to decide to kill or not, they're going to use that power. And we just had Trump and Barr use their power to the hill. They could kill, and they did. So they killed 15 human beings in a short period of time because they had the power. And I'm realizing more and more in the Greg decision, it was, had fault lines in it from the beginning. It could never be fair. It can never be equal. First of all, an impossible criteria. Not your ordinary murders, you'd seek the death penalty. Not your garden variety murder. Only the worst of the worst. Nobody knows what that means. Somebody kills my mama. The only one in the universe, my mama, who can never be replaced. You want to tell me that's not the worst? of the, Every murder of a human being is the worst of the worst. So you set this impossible criteria, fuzzy, nobody knows what it means, coupled with the discretion of prosecutors to seek death or not. You have a prosecutor who wants to seek death all the way through to the execution, a person's going to die. If you have a prosecutor that holds off and doesn't seek death, the person doesn't die. 17 years on federal death row, no executions. Simply because the administration then, the Obama administration before, and the attorney general, no big desire to kill. Then you get a Trump whose whole style was a violent style, whose whole way of being, who, who pulled a, uh, put up a full page ad in the New York Times to bring back the death penalty and kill the Central Park Five when a jogger had been mercilessly beaten, blaming these black kids whose confessions were all extorted from them. They were all innocent, but his style was to dominate. His style was to use force. His style was to send in the military against the Black Lives Matter protests going on in Portland. That's his style. So give him the death penalty and he's going to use it. So the fault lines were in the Greg decision from the beginning and it could never work. We have made so many mistakes in the application of the death penalty for every nine people who have been executed and the 1500 plus people killed who've been gassed and shot and electrocuted and lethally injected one person has been exonerated. We have made a mistake one out of every nine times. Can you picture getting an airplane ticket where they got to tell you, we well, just want to alert you that you got a one in nine chance of making it without the plane going down in flames. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to drive. I mean, that's how broken the thing is. My realization just recently is the racism stems right into the Supreme Court who have never gotten it on race. Rick mentioned Plessy v. Ferguson. Other decisions, well, of course, McCluskey. Imagine saying they would not acknowledge pattern. They would take only the individual crime and just say, the, you have to prove the prosecutor intentionally was racist and went after this person precisely because the person was black, which is impossible. But here's the implicit racism in the Supreme Court. Not that it's conscious. It's that you have, for the most part, white people of privilege who look at the words equal protection under the law and words in documents, whether it be a constitution or words in the Bible, are not neutral words. We bring our experience and our culture to words when we interpret them. As Thurgood Marshall said, the first African-American on the US Supreme Court, when I as a black man look at those words equal protection under law and somebody who's gone to a white prep school and know nothing but privilege all their life is gonna interpret the words equal 
uh, protection under the law, we come away with a very different interpretation. So you have, think of it as a glasses or a prism through which these people on the Supreme Court, all people of privilege, resource people, interpret the law as just happened with the speeded up executions at the federal level. There were lower court decisions in the appeals courts that were looking at individual legal issues in these cases and the US Supreme Court in their haste to get these people killed went roughshod over all of those appeals and hasten the executions because they could. The power goes all the way up to the people making those decisions. Our work, our work is to educate the people. And there's a psalm that says, truth springs up from the ground. Look at the education that has happened in the Reed family where Rodney Reed's mama said, you are not gonna kill my boy without the whole world knowing about it. People rise up. Ordinary folks like us who haven't had a family member uh, that's been the subject of prejudice, but we see and we awaken and we, and we connect with each other. I've been working kind of like Rick, we go back, we go back. But when you're on fire, and I put this as the, uh, as the prelude in my book, River of Fire, and it's my story about as a white privileged woman living in the suburbs, very removed from suffering, how I woke up and my faith tells me that's a great grace to wake up because we could live our whole lives not being awake. We could be spend our whole lives on our Saturday morning not going to a panel. We are here today together because we are awake. And, and, and my waking up really was sealed in the witnessing of the killing of Patrick Sonier, who was electrocuted to death. And it was at a time where no religious leaders were standing up about the death penalty at all. But it goes like this, and I'll end with this. They killed a man with fire one night. It's why I have fire in the title of the book. They killed a man with fire one night. They strapped him to a wooden chair and pumped electricity through his body until he was dead. His killing was a legal act because he had killed. No religious leaders protested the killing that night, but I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And what I saw set my soul on fire, a fire that burns in me still. And now here's an account of how I came to be in the killing chamber that night and the spiritual currents that drew me there. I keep going because of people like you. I keep going. I'm writing an article right now for the Nation uh, magazine. I think I wanna entitle it, hope is an active verb. When we have hope and we see and we understand and we have a moral imperative burning inside us, we act. We're not just standing on the side, paralyzed and watching history go by. We act, we move, we learn, we join together. And that's why I'm really glad to be a part of this with you today. And we must not think because our numbers are small or it looks like we, we are getting there much too slowly. No doubt the death penalty is the practice of torture. You cannot sentence to die conscious, imaginative beings who sit in small cells 15, 20 years and then take are taken out to be killed. Everybody I know on death row has had the same nightmare. The guards are coming from me. It's my time. I'm kicking. I'm screaming. They're pulling me out of my cell only to wake up and look around. I'm still in my cell, not now. And then to watch like Joseph Odell in Virginia who watched as 20 people that he knew were led past his cell to be killed, to be executed. It is the practice of torture defined in the UN Convention Against Torture as an extreme mental and physical or physical assault on someone rendered defenseless. You render a person defenseless and then what greater mental anguish that they're gonna kill me in two days. They're gonna kill me in one day. They're gonna kill me in a few hours. 
All these things are wrong with the death penalty. And here's the hope. I have been in every city, crisscrossed this nation many times. The American people I have met and talked to are not people bent on killing their fellow citizens. They have been made to be afraid and they have been separated from watching, being able to see when people are killed. And that secrecy of it, that doing it behind prison walls where people can't see it, that is, has made them detached to until they are educated. 34 states now have the death penalty on the books and each of those states hasn't had an execution in 10 years. Louisiana, we killed eight people in eight and a half weeks in the 80s that Rick referred to. We haven't had an execution in 17 years except for one consensual execution who gave up his appeals. You can see it changing. So we have to be active. There's a new threshold of consciousness now that all these federal executions have happened and it's time to move. So I'm happy to be in your company. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. This is really the ending for the third time. I could make myself do it the other two times, but this is it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Helen. We really appreciate those words and your wisdom and your hard work. And it's inspiring for us to hear this from, from a person of your stature. So thank you so much for joining us. Okay, uh, that was really inspiring. Our, our next speaker uh, is uh, Miss Megan Rolak, uh, who is going to speak to us on who is the Racial Justice Coalition, what is the bill filed, and what folks can do to be supportive of its passage. Uh, Ms. Rolag is president and executive director of the Racial Justice Coalition. Uh, she recently received her JD from the University of Houston Law Center. Although originally a Nebraska native, Megan attended Baylor University in Waco, Texas and majored in international studies in Spanish. During her undergraduate career, she interned as a Bob Bullock policy fellow in the Texas Senate during the 84th Texas Texas legislative session and a youth ambassador for No Kid Hungry slash Texas Hunger Initiative. During law school, Megan developed an interest in on-campus act organizations like the Alternative Dispute Resolution, ADR team, the Association of International Petroleum Negotiators, and the Energy and Environmental Law Society, uh, EELS. She also completed internships in the chambers of the Honorable Francis Stacy, U.S. Magistrate for the Southern District of Texas, Mexico's National Hydrocarbons Commission, the Texas Immunization Partnership, Baker Hughes, GE, and Inpex Americas. Additionally, she clerked for three litigation firms. Currently, Megan is the president and as I said before, the executive director of the Racial Justice Coalition, which operates in Texas and Nebraska. So welcome, Megan. Thank you for being here. And without further ado, we bring forth Megan Rolag. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Um, hi, everyone. I hope everyone's having a, a great day. Um, it's tough to follow up, uh, Sister Helen, so just bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a little background on the Racial Justice Coalition. Um, we're an organization, like Mustafa said, that operates in Texas and Nebraska. And we are committed to analyzing and mitigating racial bias in sentencing and convictions. So we're an organization that not only looks at death penalty sentencing, but we look at sentencing trends generally. And one of those aims is, um, we seek to do research on looking at racial disparities in sentencing and convictions. We also seek to advocate for wrongfully convicted individuals uh, and we seek to promote policy. So uh, one of our big goals uh, in Texas is to introduce the Racial Justice Act uh, in the state of Texas this legislative session. Um, we are actually set to file it next week and we've we have our bill language drafted up. And for folks who aren't familiar with the Racial Justice Act, uh, essentially um, this, would, this bill would create an extra appeal for folks uh, in capital cases 
to appeal their sentencing or even their conviction if racial bias, implicit or explicit, uh, aggravated their sentence or actually contributed them to being convicted in the first place. So um, this is really meaningful because if anyone is familiar with Texas and the death penalty, like I'm sure many folks are, uh, not only is Texas very prolific in executions, but uh, the racial disparities are bleak. Um, even looking at um, very death penalty friendly counties like Dallas County, Tarrant County and Harris County, and we see that the vast majority of individuals sent to death row are black men. And um, I know that Rick had referenced this and Sister Helen had referenced this and so, so did Roderick, but the death penalty involves so much discretion, not only by prosecutors, but also by how juries are, are put together. And so this act would allow for an individual to say, hey, I have statistical evidence that shows uh, that there's a pervasive issue with racial bias in my case. And this addresses the McCleskey issue that Rick mentioned, um, where essentially the Supreme Court said, no, we're, we're not going to allow you, uh, you know, a black man who, who believes his case was a product of racial bias to use things like statistical evidence to show a system-wide problem. You would have to show purposeful discrimination just in your case alone in a vacuum. And why that's so important is because you look at very compelling stats like how many black individuals are sentenced to death of the whole out of places like Harris County. Um, those are compelling numbers that a, that, that, um, a judge should hear. And, and it's very important that we give people tools to talk about racial bias in, in a statistical context, because um, frankly, our courts don't see things like implicit bias or even varying degrees of explicit bias as compelling enough to, to spare someone their life. And so this legislation, we filed it in Nebraska, actually on a broader uh, scale. It's applicable to all felonies, not just capital cases. Um, but this legislation will be huge for folks on death row in Texas because not only uh, does it give people another shot, um, but it's also going to amend the state writ process to allow for statistical evidence to be allowed in the state writ process as well. Not just in a sentencing question, but also in, in whatever relief someone's seeking when they're appealing even their conviction, uh, they can use statistical evidence, uh, all other types of extrinsic evidence um, to really argue their case. And we believe that this is so important because um, not only are courts resistant to really the concept of, of racial bias and racism, but they're also resistant to things like data and science. And so we hope that this bill will also spur further study uh, that organizations will join us in generating more data and more statistical studies so that folks have these tools to appeal their sentencing um, but that's really like our main goal in Texas right now. Um, we're, our work in Nebraska uh, also deals with generating uh, statistical studies. Um, it, Nebraska does have the death penalty. They repealed it, then reinstated it. Um, and so this will be applicable to people on death row in Nebraska as well. So we are so excited to file this bill. Right now, the bill authors will be uh, Senator Jose Menendez and Representative Symphonia Thompson. So we are very excited. And a few ways that folks can get involved is um, visit our website and sign up for updates because the moment this bill goes to committee uh, or even the floor of either of the House or the Senate, we're going to need folks to call their senators and their representatives. Um, we do have a uphill battle to fight here, but we believe that people's awareness of the death penalty has, you know, really increased, like Sister Helen said, uh, in, con in the context of the federal death penalty. Um, I, I think that it'll shock a lot of folks that, you know, horrible, um, you know, practices such as the law of the parties, my dog is sneezing. Um, <laughs> 
love the parties exist and that people often don't have any type of relief when they're in this situation where they're given the death penalty for just being present. Um, and so, so we, I'll put a link to sign up for our updates in the chat for everyone at home watching. And um, if you could sign up, we could really rally uh, some support and get some activism going once we get this bill filed next week. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, we really appreciate the information and the work uh, that the Racial Justice Coalition is, is performing. And we want to also encourage everybody uh, to do what Megan said and to call your senators and representatives uh, so that we can help uh, go help help her uphill in this battle. Okay, uh, we have now our brother, Mr. Hadi Jawad, who's the outreach coordinator for Amnesty International Dallas, uh, to give us some closing thoughts, uh, and he's going to introduce uh, Mr. Abraham Bonowitz as well. So, uh, Hadi, without further ado. Oh, hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. On behalf of Amnesty International Dallas, I would like to thank all of our coalition partners, in particular, Dr. Rick Halpern, Susie Bell Gosley of the League of Women Voters of Texas, Joyce Hall of Cox Christie, Roderick Reed, Megan Golag, and our group leader and moderator, Mustafa Carroll. I would be remiss if I didn't mention my cohort and colleague, uh, Jennifer Harrison of Amnesty International Dallas, uh, who helped uh, us put this whole thing together. Uh, the complete list of our coalition partners uh, Mustafa recited at the beginning is also on our Facebook page. We are planning to offer additional webinars this year, uh, two more to be exact related to the death penalty. One will focus on the cost of the death penalty to taxpayers and why red states are abolishing it. The death penalty is a moral issue for some and a policy issue for others, but it is also a government run program uh, with related costs and possible benefits. Uh, many people assume that the state saves money by employing the death penalty uh, since an executed person no longer requires uh, confinement, health care, and related expenses. But in the modern application of the capital punishment, that assumption has been proven to be completely wrong. Another webinar that we will offer, uh, uh, inshallah, God willing, this year, will discuss the role of politics and the politicization of the death penalty, or to put it very bluntly, quote, killing to get votes. Um, U US Supreme Court Justice uh, John Paul Stevens uh, has a quote. Uh, he said that a campaign promise to be tough on crime or to enforce the death penalty is evidence of bias that should disqualify a candidate from sitting in criminal cases. Um, death penalty opponents, uh, here's some good news. Uh, we have made some great strides over the last decade, getting states to outlaw the sentence or at least reduce its use. Now we are gaining allies from local officials with direct power to shut down capital punishment. Our spirits are lifted as we note that a wave of district attorneys who ran for office in the last election cycle in counties with major metropolitan areas, such as Fulton County, Atlanta, Los Angeles County, Los Angeles, Travis County, Austin, and a big shout out to uh, uh, DA Jose Garza, uh, Pima County, Tucson, uh, Multnomah County, Portland, Oregon, who bravely proclaimed in their campaigns that if elected, they would not seek the death penalty. And guess what? One. Um, add to that, re that list recent runoff wins by abolitionist district attorneys representing Athens, Georgia, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, we are hopeful and prayerful district attorneys in Dallas County. Uh, our, our beloved uh, DA here, Mr. John Cruzo, is uh, listening or some of his staff members are listening to this discussion, to this critical discussion. We have invited them uh, as we invited uh, Dallas City Council members and Dallas County commissioners who are participating uh, in this discussion, some of them. Uh, will join the march of history and put an end to this barbaric and archaic and racist practice. District, district attorneys play a crucial role in the death penalty system. We cannot talk about criminal justice reform or any claim to being a civilized society if we continue to maintain and support the capricious, arbitrary, and racist death penalty system in Texas and the United States. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure and my honor to introduce to you 
uh, somebody we added very late, like maybe an hour ago to the program, uh, Brother uh, Abraham Bonovitz. He's the uh, director and the co-founder of the death penalty action. A lot of stuff is going on at the federal level. We are grateful to uh, President Biden for his stance on the death penalty. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Brother Abraham and he can give us maybe a two, three minute uh, quick update on what's happening at the federal level and what people can do uh, to take some action. Well, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, my name is Abe Bonowitz. I run a group called Death Penalty Action. Um, Rick and Roderick are part of our team. We're doing a lot of work together. And I'm just grateful to be here with you today. I'm going to share my screen. But first, I want to tell you that the opportunity before us is real, both in Texas to create change, but also with the federal death penalty. We've just gotten through with 13 executions, an execution spree that was went, uh, in six months, 13 people. And my belief is that every single one of those executions created more abolitionists. In fact, more than half a million people have joined our organization just in the last month and a half. Okay. The good news here is that we don't have to change anybody's minds. We just have to get the people who agree with us to do something. And Death Part of the Action is here to make it easy. You don't have to do it with Death Part of the Action. There's lots of other organizations. You can just look up your representatives yourself. But if you want to make it easy, go to deathpartoftheaction.org and take the actions. Uh, there's a picture of Rod Rodney Reed. If you don't know what Rodney looks like, uh, uh, he's in the video on our front page. This is the front page of our website. And if you just scroll down a little bit, visit the Federal Action page. And you know, there's a couple of videos to show you some of what's all about, but we've got three things to do, four actually. One is write to President Biden and ask him to sign the executive order. There's a number of us. This is something we can do really, really quick. And we wanna deliver these petitions on Monday afternoon. So please do that, share it. The other most important thing to do, write your member of Congress. You just go to this page right here and you plug in your information and it fills up your member of Congress and your, your representative and also your two senators. And uh, and then it's simply very easy to do. And once you do that, you'll get an email that also says, here's how you find their postal address and you write them a handwritten note if you can't put it in the postal mail. For people that don't live in the United States, you can sign the, the petition to Congress. But there's the other thing, and especially any of you that are part of a, of a faith community or a team or a club or a business or whatever it is, you can sign the organizational sign-on letter, which uh, is here. And, and, and this is what Ayanna Presley is talking about. In fact, she is going to be having a meeting with us. Here's some pictures from our, our actions down in Terre Haute protesting those executions. But Ayanna Presley um, is having a meeting with us for the, the signers on this congressional letter. So you gotta be an organization. You can see lots of different Amnesty International groups have signed on as well as big organizations like the Innocence Project, the Southern Center for Human Rights and all that. And so far we've got more than 240 organizations that have signed on. And of course, once you've signed your organization on, we're asking you to, to you know, get all the people connected with your organization to contact your members of Congress. Same thing works at the state level. So this is the federal campaign. You've got a state campaign. That's what the previous speaker was talking about. Happy to take any questions. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thank, thank you, Abe. Uh, we appreciate the information that you brought to us. And uh, we're now gonna go into our question and answer uh, forum. Uh, and the first question that we have is from uh, Michelle Reed. What difference, who's asked the question, what's different this time? When hostile white power rises again, what have we learned from the past that can help us to overcome another white dominance and claim to power? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna ask uh, Rick to answer that question. Or anybody else who wants to answer. Well, what's different this time, and I think it's been very different since the tragic killing of George Floyd uh, last spring, which was witnessed, of course, uh, as, as it happened, it was just horrible. I think the technology is such today, and Abe just gave a good example of it, the technology is such where we live in real time, 
and we can see the consequences of bad behavior, uh, whether it's storming the Capitol, uh, as we just saw a few weeks ago, when you get to see Charlottesville white racism uh, in our face, in our TVs, as it happens, uh, this engenders, or hopefully would engender, immediate reaction against such behavior. So it's frustrating. This is a long running disease. Uh, we shouldn't have it in our society. But the more frustrated we feel and the more we feel like we can't do anything only feeds this mentality. So it takes mobilizing, it takes action, it takes nonviolent responses to counter this mentality. And it certainly takes a political action uh, to stop supporting and to hold all of our candidates, whoever our candidates look like, uh, to hold them accountable for their human rights views and what, what are they gonna do? You see the same thing I do. Uh, angry white lawmakers at the state level and even in Congress and the Senate who, who speak for you and me supposedly, uh, Cruz, Cornyn, Hawley in Missouri, Mo Brooks in Alabama, uh, this litany of white politicians who remain out of touch with human reality. And our job is to hold them accountable and support candidates to get these people out of office and to bring to office different candidates with a view supportive of human rights. This is not overnight work. It just takes time. It's organizing, as Stacey Abrams had done, uh, has done in Atlanta. You saw the, the fruits of that effort. Two, two different senators that aren't uh, the two who were there. Uh, so it takes organizing. It works uh, at the community level. But being aware of human rights is a start. That's the start. Get active. OK, thank you, Rick. Uh, uh, next question is, uh, and I want to, I hope that uh, Roderick is still here. Uh, and there's a question, why has the Innocent Project not taken on Roderick's case? That's the question. Yeah, I think he has left. Has Roderick left? OK, then Megan, can you take that on? Well, this is Abe. I, I, I could tell you that they, they have taken on Roderick's case, Rodney's case. The Innocence Project is working on that case. Okay. All right. I guess that, that's the answer. Good. All right. Um, there's a, here's another uh, attended uh, participant listening from Gretna, Manitoba, Canada. Any insight to this curious, uh oh, things are going moving now. Oh, goodness. What happened to it? Sorry, I moved it. I'll read it. Um, listening in from Gretna, Manitoba, Canada, any insight to this curious difference? At the same time in the mid 70s that the US reinstated the death penalty, Canada abolished the death penalty. And um, this was typed during um, Rick's presentation. Okay. Okay, Rick. Well, you know, there are, there's no shortage of differences between the history uh, in Canada, and Canada has had its own problems with race, let's be clear, uh, against indigenous people, uh, interning Canadian Japanese during the war longer than Americans did. So it's, it's, uh, they have their problems. But uh, the major, one of the major differences in between Canada and the United States, and beside many countries in the United States, relates to gun violence. This is a violent society. Uh, everybody here knows that. Uh, Americans, uh, we have over what, 500 million guns in the United States. There are more guns than there are gasoline stations in this country. And it's en en enshrined in uh, the Second Amendment, uh, however people interpret it, rightly or wrongly, uh, about the, quote, right to have a gun. And many other countries, uh, this, this doesn't exist. And you just can't have 40 and 50,000 people murdered a year uh, by knife attacks, arson, and other forms of killing when guns make 
uh, killing so readily available in the mindset of uh, the heat of passion uh, to use a gun and pick up a gun and kill somebody. So a lot of this is centered in inappropriate usage of gun violence. And I just want to be clear, many people own guns in this country and are responsible with them. They are not the problem. The problem are people who are not responsible with guns or criminals who shouldn't have them and get them and use them to the detriment of causing pain and anger in our society that fuels this need for revenge against them for what they've done. A lot of this is just our love, our cultural love of violence. Okay, uh, another question for, for you, Rick. Uh, do we know the nominated eight Attorney General's point of view on the death penalty? Uh, Merrick Garland is opposed to the death penalty. Okay, very good. Okay, all right. Uh, another question. It seems Tarrant County has emerged as the current epicenter for death penalty during the past year. Any ideas on the best way to spotlight, spotlight this DA's behavior and raise public awareness as we wind down COVID-19. Uh, anyone want to take that one? <laughs> Megan, Abe, Rick, anybody? I mean, uh, so forgive me, my dog's gonna bark because now she's on the other side of the room uh, throwing a fit. But basically, um, one way you can spotlight DA's behavior like that is I think our legislation is a great way to do that because uh, cases coming out of Tarrant County, if you can establish a pattern or get along racial lines or something like that, um, you'll be able to kind of put together a case. Um, I, I think that the best thing to do is also um, just highlighting the cases, um, even on the local level, because I don't think a lot of folks understand how the death penalty is really purely a choice in Texas uh, specifically. Um, th there are really a lack of controls and checks on prosecutors seeking the death penalty. So I think actionable steps would be promoting legislation like ours that we're filing next week. But also um, I do know that the Dallas Morning News does a lot of investigative uh, journalism on the death penalty. And so even writing in to them and writing in to say, hey, I want to write an editorial on what's happening in the county, that would be helpful. Okay, very good. Thanks, Megan. Uh, just, uh, just so all of our attendees, our participants know, uh, if we don't get a chance to answer all of the questions, we're going to be posting them, posting the answers on our Facebook page. So don't get too bent out of shape if you don't get all of the questions answered. Okay, uh, there's a question here. Will that evidentiary hearing be open to the public? I'm not sure as to what evidence you're hearing. They're, they're asking, I think, about the, Rod, the Rodney Reed case. Okay. Um, and and yes, typically these, well, I guess it's going to be a question of where we are with the pandemic and how they're handling that. Hopefully um, it would be broadcast you know, on the closed circuit or however they would do that. Uh, but in normal times, anybody that could fit in would be able to go. Okay. Very good. Uh, looking at here. Um, here's another question, and this is to Abe. Are any national churches signed on to the Action Network? Um, well, by Action Network, that, that's the tool that we're using. I think you mean the um, the campaign. Uh, you know, all of the mainstream um, communities of faith have been part of the anti-death penalty movement for many years. But in particular, you know, one of the first groups to sign on was the National Council of Churches. Of course, uh, we just had the US Association of Catholic Priests sign on. The Catholic Mobilizing Network is planning to as soon as there is bipartisan sponsorship. Um, so you know, really every major faith organization, uh, many Jewish organizations, some Muslim organizations, you can see the whole list, and then many individual congregations. So if you're a part of a faith community, you can take this to your faith community and invite that local faith community to, to, uh, to sign on to the campaign. And then, of course, turn around and ask everybody individually to take, um, take action. 
But yeah, the, the nutshell, of course, is that the faith community has always been in leadership opposed to the death penalty. Mustafa, I just want to add that uh, I, as a Muslim, am particularly proud that the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Dallas Fort Worth chapter uh, that you represent, uh, has uh, taken on this issue uh, uh, amongst all of the organizations that support this work. Thank you for oh. that. Very good. And, and I would just add, especially if you are um, having a conversation in your community, you know, we're happy. Uh, Dr. Halpern and others are happy to come and have the conversation. You know, the, the I do want to say that I came into Amnesty International in favor of the death penalty. That's my first entry into this work. Um, I argued with those folks and then I set off to try to prove them wrong. And I share that with you because it's a motivating thing for me to help us understand that, you know, people just need more information and time. And if we can plant seeds of doubt and give people things to explore, then even if they still believe that there are people who deserve whatever they get coming, they can get to a place where they understand that we can't trust government with the power to kill. And when the words that are carved into the face of the US Supreme Court building are equal justice under law, ask anybody who's ever encountered the, the criminal legal system, do you think we have equal justice under law? And the answer has to be no because if you've ever encountered it, you know. Okay, very good, thanks, Abe. Uh, another question, what relevant bills have already been filed in the Texas legislative session? <laughs> uh, Rick, could, could you take that one? Or? Uh, I, 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 do not, I do not know yet. I have not seen the full listing of bills filed. Uh, we hope to have that by the end of the month. Uh, maybe Megan knows, but I, I don't. I haven't seen the list yet. Yeah, I know that someone has already filed a bill to uh, take the death penalty off the books in Texas. Um, I think that's consistently filed every year. And mm -hmm. our legislation, the Racial Justice Act, will be filed next week. So well, that's, I, that's all I know for now. Well, I happen to know that there have been three bills filed. Uh, one with... Uh, uh, State Representative Eddie Lucio, I think his is to abolish the death penalty. And I do know that Harold Dutton and Jarvis Johnson have filed, filed bills uh, to not seek the death penalty in the law of pardons, which means if you just happen to be there and you weren't the shooter or the person that actually killed the person, then, then they're asking that no death penalty for those persons. Uh, but we're still a long way from abolishing it. Okay. Um, Mustafa, can I add something right quick? Sure. Um, many people may not have seen this, uh, but it's, it's uh, quite groundbreaking that the state of Ohio, just uh, within the, just this month, the state of Ohio became the first state in the United States to pass legislation that will ban uh, executions of persons with serious mental illness. Uh, there are five other states that have introduced similar legislation. Texas, of course, is not one of them. But uh, this would be uh, groundbreaking if, if, or dare I say, when multiple states follow this Ohio example and again, exclude another group of people with a serious mental illness from being executed. This uh, is long overdue, and uh, this would be an area of opportunity for people who want to work with their lawmakers here in Texas or other states to get a copy of the Ohio bill and to use this as a model to get other states, including our own, hopefully, uh, to get bills to eliminate the death penalty for persons with serious mental illness. Okay, very good. Uh, I, may I just add one thing to that? Uh, I, I'll just note, I worked on that campaign here in Ohio. I live in Ohio and um, it took us three sessions to pass that bill. I put a link to the Ohio, uh, uh, oh, there's an extra O in there. It should be the O-A-I-M-E, Ohio Alliance I'm sorry, the Ohio Alliance for the Mental Illness Exemption. I, I typed it in wrong, um, but I'll retype it. Uh, that's where you can find copies of the bill and some of what the messaging that we use. And, and, and that's the key thing is when you want to create 
that kind of change, incremental change. You figure out who are the right people to be leading that charge and put them up front. So it was the mental health community that led the charge here, as well as conservatives that uh, recognized that we don't need to be killing mentally ill people uh, that led on that, and that's how we passed it. Okay. Uh, we, we only have time for one more question, and the question is, could you remind us why in 1972 the death penalty was put on hold, and why was it reinstated in 1976? Uh, yes, very quickly, the death penalty was stopped in 1972. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ruled that at the time that, it's, that it was stopped, that its application was too arbitrary and capricious. Uh, the death penalty itself was not unconstitutional, but the court decided that the way it was being applied was unconstitutionally arbitrary and capricious uh, because people were being executed or sentenced to death for crimes that didn't even involve a homicide. Uh, starting in 1976, when the court uh, said, okay, it's okay to start sentencing people again to death, the court narrowed the guidelines under which states could sentence people to death, basically saying, one, you had to commit a homicide to, to be sentenced to death, and two, not only did you have to have one homicide, but you had to commit a, another felony with that homicide. Robbery murder, rape murder, kidnap murder, burglary murder, something murder. So uh, the, the parameters were narrowed, and that's, uh, that's why it was stopped and why it was restarted. Okay, thank you, Rick. And thanks, uh, I wanna thank all of our panelists for participating in today's uh, program uh, and thank those folks who have attended. Uh, we have run out of time. Uh, our program ends at one. And uh, just to reiterate that if your questions didn't get answered, uh, during this live session, we're going to post them on Facebook and answer them there. So thank you all very much and may God bless everyone. Take care.